it's on. I guess the hour has arrived, so we'll begin. I'll call this meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society to order. My name is Richard Conkle, and I'm the president of the society. And this is our monthly meeting for the month of November. At this time, I will have our secretary, um, Jerry Smith, give us minutes from the last meeting. October's general meeting took place on the 4th of October 2020 at the York History Center. We had nine people attending in person and we believe there were 15 watching live online. Prior meeting minutes that were taken by Becky were read and accepted. The treasurer reported a balance of $19,162.85 at the end of September. The membership report was 162 renewals, 42 non-renewals, and three new members as of the meeting date. Uh, Nicole provided an overview of the upcoming York History Center programs. VP Jonathan Steyer provided information on our upcoming programs. And the presentation was several member discussions of genealogical research they had undertaken during the pandemic. Thank you, Jerry. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, they stand approved as read. At uh, this time, our treasurer, Margaret Berg, will give us treasurer's report. Okay, the balance at October 1st, 2020 was $19,162.85. Receipts for the month were membership renewals, $210, one new member, uh, $25, donations of $10 for a total of $245 in receipts. There were no disbursements for October, leaving the cash balance at uh, October 31st, 2020, $19,407.85. Membership, we have 171 members. We had eight renew in the month of October and one new person in that month. Uh, not renewed, 35. Uh, I have sent out uh, letters and email to the non-renewals and that was an, a, a total of 42 had gone out on that. That's it. Thank you, Margaret. That will be filed for audit. Um, we don't have a whole lot of people here today in person. A lot of times I will ask if we have anyone who's here for the first time. Do we have any first time people here? Okay, and your, and your names? Uh, I'm Dale Beard. I'm Sherry Beard. Okay, and where are you from? East York. Okay, so not so far away. We're glad you could be with us. We're glad you could be with us today. I think everyone else has been here before pretty much. Um, at this time, we'll have Nicole Smith from the York County History Center give us news from the History Center. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, just a couple of announcements. A reminder that the Library and Archives is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. Um, please call ahead or uh, make an appointment online. Um, all of our programs and webinars are being live streamed to the History Center Facebook page, including this one. They're also recorded and available and will be available on the History Center website. Uh, coming up on November 14th, that's a Saturday, is our uh, second Saturday lecture will be by Jim McClure and will be about the Articles of Confederation and the Colonial Era in York. That uh, lecture will be on site here, uh, reservations required. Uh, please check our website for some virtual Articles of Confederation Day activities. On November 18th, uh, the Civil War Roundtable will present, Scott Mangus actually will present, Civil War Politics, Abraham Lincoln and York County, PA. That'll be interesting. And on November 21st, we have our own Becky Anstein presenting a webinar on beginning genealogy online. And uh, for more information, please see our website or give us a call. That's all I have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nicole. Well, now I'll turn the program over to our Vice President, Jonathan Stair, who will give us information about future meetings and introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Richard. I just want to remind everybody that next month, December, we, uh, we normally do not have a meeting, so we'll not have a meeting. And the next meeting of this organization will be held on January the 3rd. And it will be another one of our sharing meetings. Uh, this time we're going to ask you to share about family artifacts. If you are not here in person but watching this remotely and you have a story about a family artifact that you would like to share with us, uh, feel free to uh, send that to us by email and we'd be glad to read that at our meeting. So that's January the 3rd. February the 7th, uh, York County's coroner Pam Gay will come and talk about the duties of the coroner and the records that the coroner keeps. And hopefully, I asked her also to talk a little bit about the historical records of the coroner. March the 7th, either in person or remotely, it'll depend on the status of the pandemic, the state archivist David Carmichael will be speaking to us about the new state archives building and also um, what online resources they have been building while they're, they're closed for the pandemic. And I may have somebody from the State Archives come at a future meeting and talk about all the online resources. There's much more there. Every day it grows. And uh, you may not be aware of all the things you can get online without actually having to go to the State Archives. April the 11th will be Kara Curtis from uh, Cumberland County Historical Society speaking about uh, genealogical research in Cumberland County. And May the 2nd, uh, we will be meeting, hopefully, down at Muddy Creek Forks and take a tour of the um, railroad village down there, the Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad Preservation Society uh, facilities. And finally, on June the 13th of 2021, we will have our an or, uh, biannual Henry James Young Award program. I just want to make say one caveat, and that is all this is dependent on the status of the pandemic. <laughs> so watch our website, watch our Facebook page, uh, in case we do have to cancel meetings if things get worse. Our speaker today is uh, Jean Kilheffer Hess, and I'm quite delighted to have her here for a number of reasons. First of all, she is executive director of the Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society, which has a very uh, fond place in my heart because I worked there for about six weeks and also uh, used their wonderful resources. If you have research in Lancaster County, whether they're Mennonites or not, that's an excellent place to do research. Uh, she also is owner of uh, Story Share, which is an oral history interviewing and life story business, and she's been doing that for uh, about 10 years. Another thing that Jean and I have in common is we both graduated from Messiah College. She's a Messiah College graduate, although uh, quite a number of years after I did. And interestingly enough, her degree from Messiah College was in, count uh, in accounting, she has her MBA, but uh, while she was at Messiah College, she did work as uh, a uh, clerical assistant in the archives, and that uh, stimulates some of her interest in history. So at this time, I would like you to welcome uh, Jean Kilheffer Hess. to have the opportunity to share with you today. And I wanted to give you, at the start, a little preview of how we'll be spending our time together. We'll look at why oral histories and address what they can bring to your genealogical research. You'll get an interactive overview of what it takes to conduct an oral history interview. I'll share some tips for finding existing oral histories and I'll conclude by mentioning uh, some of those genealogical resources that Jonathan referred to available at Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society. Does that sound fun? <laughs> An oral history interview can, bring re can be a real treasure and bring real treasure to what you know about your ancestors. This is especially the case if it was well planned for recorded, transcribed, and contributed to a local or topical archive so that it can be made available for researchers. 
When you research using newspaper articles or tax records or draft cards or minutes from public meetings, you have a general sense of the kinds of things that you expect to find. But when you begin listening to an oral history interview or when you start reading the transcript, you really have no idea what you might encounter. There's lots of exciting anticipation. Literally anything could have been said and anything could have been asked. You'll certainly learn something new. Whether or not the narrator answers a specific question that you have, you'll learn something at least about how she or he processes questions. You'll notice a unique speaking style. You might hear local dialect words or notice that the narrator takes a long pause before replying, just like Cousin Sylvia. A good oral history interview elicits not just basic facts, but also stories. A fan chart shows the basics of who existed and how they are connected to each other, but family or community stories really bring to life, so to speak, uh, your family history in a new way. Not only do oral histories and the stories and other clues they hold build out what you know about those who lived before you, being able to document and share human interest stories can help other non-genealogists in your family become interested in what you're doing. When you've put a lot of work into your family history, the best way to conserve it is to contribute it to a reputable archives that is able to care for it and share it with researchers in the future. But if your work is not yet recorded in that way, the next best insurance policy you can have is for someone else in your family or network to get excited about it and really care about what you're doing. In addition to being personally satisfying, if someone close to you knows and cares about your genealogical work, they'll be much more likely to steward it well and maybe even help you get it to the archives if you need a little nudge. Oral histories and the stories and information drawn from them help a broader array of people care about genealogy. A bit later, I'll share some tips for finding oral histories that already exist. But first, I ask you to consider conducting one or more oral histories as part of your commitment to recording genealogy and family history. Even if you no longer have access to the generations of folks that you would have liked to ask certain things, consider conducting an interview with a cousin or a sibling or even a child or a grandchild. Capturing a bit of everyday life will be a real blessing for those in the future who want to understand life now. What do you think are the top two skills an interviewer needs for a successful recorded interview result? And this is interactive time, so I'm actually looking for answers. What do you think are the top two skills that an interviewer needs for a successful recorded interview result? A good prompter. A good prompter? Meaning prompting questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. A good listener. A good listener. Bingo, that's one of the two I picked. <laughs> what else? Uh, a way of uh, expressing intense interest in what the, uh, what the interviewee uh, have, might have to say. A way of, ex I'm going to repeat this so that folks um, watching can make sure they hear. A way of it expressing intense interest in what the interview has to say. Yes, I would say that that's important as well and closely tied to listening. A way to let them know visually that you're listening. Yes? Flexibility. Flexibility. Do you want to say any more about that? Yes, to allow the interview to go um, in the direction that the person being interviewed is comfortable with, absolutely. Actually, all of those are very closely tied. I had sort of the general categories, the ability to listen well and the skills to ask good questions. And um, what you mentioned is also really key. So before you get into the interview itself, it's important the lead up is done well. You want to issue an invitation that includes an explanation as to why you're asking this person, and I, I'll call the interviewee a narrator, so that's the language I'll use, 
why you want to interview them and how the recorded interview will be used. You also want to let them know that they'll have the opportunity after it's recorded to listen to it or read the transcript and correct it before it goes anywhere else. Sometimes people are concerned, well, if you're recording me, what if I say something wrong or what if I decide later that that thing I said really shouldn't be on the record? Um, there needs to be an opportunity for them to take a look at it. Develop rapport. If you don't already know the person, meet with them at least one time ahead of the interview and build a personal connection and let them know that the what the interview experience will be like. Now, meeting in person is ideal, but use highest caution, of course, during COVID times, and can, you could consider also meeting via video call or telephone call. Um, an interview can feel like a vulnerable experience for the narrator. So if they feel like they know you a little bit, the trust level raises, and it makes it more likely that they'll feel comfortable telling stories and wanting to share what they know. Do your research ahead of time so you don't spend precious interview time asking basic questions like, how many siblings do you have? Or what year did you graduate from high school? Those are the kinds of things you can figure out ahead of time so that you can focus your prompter questions um, on broader categories. My oral history interviewing is typically focused on life stories. And when I first meet with a narrator, I give them a form to fill out and return to me before I develop questions for the interview. And this has basic biographical information, schooling information, places they've lived, the kinds of work that they've done. But one of my favorite sections is at the back where I have a brief overview of life stages. So I, I chunk out um, kind of typical types of life stages and I ask people to provide one descriptive word and one short statement about each of these um, parts of their lives. So for example, um, this is one interviewee I worked with and she's, her adolescence, her one word was responsibility. I was the oldest in my family and had a sick mother, so I had to learn to work early. So again, you never know what you're gonna get and it can help you focus those questions um, for, the, for the interview. Okay, so now you're developing questions. Two hours is about the time limit um, that the average person can talk and remain coherent and engaged. And you'll want to prepare about 10 or 15 good questions for that time. So what do you think makes for a good question in an oral history interview? And for those of you who are um, watching via Facebook Live, I think we have the capability that you can um, enter responses to these interactive questions and um, we'll be able to make that part of our conversation together. So feel free to, to engage that way. What do you think makes for a good question? An open-ended question. An open-ended question. Bingo! <laughs> That's exactly where I was headed. <laughs> An open-ended question. You want to invite the person to reflect and talk and talk. You want them to be able to take, take a topic where they like, uh, within reason of course. And if you come in with a very regimented expectation of what you'll learn, you're doing yourself a disservice and the narrator a disservice. So if you prepare well and prepare so that the narrator can surprise you, um, you are preparing open-ended questions. And the most basic definition of an open-ended question is a question that cannot be answered with yes or no. It's tempting to say something like, you and great uncle Leonard used to sell homegrown asparagus door to door before school, right? Now that might cut it for a casual conversation at a backyard barbecue, but that doesn't cut it for an oral history interview because the interviewee, the narrator could say yes or no. Here's one. Describe your mom's personality and parenting style. That cannot be answered with a yes or a no, and you might get 20 minutes of, of response to that or more. So we're actually gonna take some time now to practice writing good interview questions. Um, imagine you're conducting an oral history interview with someone in your family, and we're gonna spend the next three minutes developing one or two open-ended questions for that interview. 
Now, if you know of someone that you would like to interview in your family, think of that person and actually develop a question you'd like to ask them. If not, think of someone you would have liked to interview, maybe whether or not you still have the chance, and um, develop a question for that interview. I'm going to try to play a little smooth jazz or something, and then I'll ask you to share your question. Again, you're writing an open-ended question um, that will help you uh, if you choose to do an oral history interview. like a good dramatic place to stop. <laughs> okay, let's have several bold people share uh, one of the questions that you developed. Start here with Archer. First, I wanted to say, I'm, by profession, I'm an attorney, so it's kind of funny I had to laugh because when I ask people questions in court, I want it to be a yes or no answer. And I don't want it to be right. And, you know, it's, it's completely the opposite. So the recommended question is, what interaction did you have growing up with uh, members of your extended family? And Richard also um, noted that as an attorney, he's typically trying to craft que questions that do get a yes or no response. <laughs> so. And I always want to know the answer beforehand. <laughs> What Christmas traditions did your family have? And then what did you feel were the most popular of those traditions and why? Excellent, thanks. Yes. This is a comment. We were in Germany meeting my family. My sons were about, four, about 12 and 14. And we walked down the street. 
Okay, and the kids were so disappointed in meeting us because they expected people out of the Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> All they watched was Western movies. <laughs> A comment about meeting uh, German family members who expected the Americans to look like they stepped out of a Western. <laughs> so the more we know about um, people in our extended family, the better for, for good connection. Other questions that you developed? Well, my father-in-law grew up on a farm in eastern North County. He was always talking about um, things that he did. And one of the questions that I probably should ask him was, uh, as a boy and as a young man, he was working on other people's farms. And, and I would like to ask him, what types of work did you do as a boy for other people? Mm -hmm. What types of work did you do as a boy for other people? And that could be relevant in a farming context or others, for sure. Yeah, great. In the uh, early 1990s, I had the opportunity to interview my uh, mother's six brothers, uh, five brothers, one was gone away. And uh, one sister. And my question to them, because I was very interested in him, was what were their memories of their father? Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how much I learned about their father, who my mother wouldn't talk much about him. And um, each one of them had all different kinds of things. And I got a fantastic picture of the man that died uh, eight years before I was born. Wow. So um, she was sharing a personal experience of interviewing her five mm -hmm. uncles, and the question that she asked and got really great, uh, helpful responses on was, um, what were your memories of your father? And he was gone at that point. So great, great example. Yes? I had a great aunt, my uh, grandmother's younger sister, who I never really got to uh, talk to her very much until she was 90 years old, but she had such a sharp mind. By the way, she had been a legal secretary. Her husband had been a lawyer. <coughs> but at any rate, uh, every time I would get to visit her, and I did get to see her, she was uh, a long-time widow living in Pasadena, California. And every time I got to see her, which was sometimes uh, as often as once or twice a year, I would pump her for recollections that she might have had about members of the family. And uh, I know that she was holding back an awful lot that she never told anybody except me. Mm -hmm. And it uh, was utterly fascinating. And she gave me just enough clues that I was able to trace her grandmother's ancestry back into Lancashire, England, and three generations um, who had been born and baptized at, at Manchester Cathedral. Wow. And uh, we, uh, my wife and I had an opportunity to visit there about two years ago. And uh, I give my, uh, my great aunt uh, all the credit for, she said, I said, well, where in England did they live? Well, she said, I think it was someplace like Chester or Manchester. I don't know. So <laughs> I picked one of those and uh, was able to, uh, to get put on the right path. What a great story about talking with your 90-year-old great aunt. Yes. Repeatedly. I'm not sure about how she felt about being pumped for some oh, <laughs> of her <laughs> stories. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, giving, I'm just giving you a hard time. I, it sounds like you got some really great details, and then you were able to um, yeah. build your genealogy back even and further. I've, I've uh, written a, quite a long paragraph in the uh, Evans family history about Aunt Mabel. That's wonderful. Well, thanks. She never children. had children, but, uh, but we... Uh, we were, uh, Sarah gave, Sarah, yeah, Sarah gave grandchildren of hers, and she was very happy to talk. And I have lived, uh, I have so many regrets about conversations that I wish I had had mm -hmm. with my grandfather and, and my grandmothers and so forth that I know they 
Yeah, probably all of us can think of someone that's no longer with us that we wish we would have asked or talked to or even one of the beautiful things about oral history interviews is one of the things that happens in that space if you do it well is the person sharing their stories feels really honored and listened to. Mm -hmm. There aren't many places in life today where you're deeply listened to and so that's also one of the blessings of, of how it can work. So when you've got your 10 questions or so, it's tempting to stack your questions. Don't do it. So, sir, what's your name? Mike. Mike, thanks. So when Mike was sharing the questions that he had developed, you may have noticed he said, you might want to ask them separately or you might want to ask them together. So I'm here to say, don't stack more than one question on top of another. It's very tempting when you're limited to 10 or 15 questions to just sort of cluster them. But what happens is, um, well, let me give you an example. You might ask, what do you remember from summers spent helping your grandparents in their general store in Duncannon? And what were some of the most popular things they sold there? So this is actually quite parallel to, <laughs> to the questions that you came up with. Now your poor narrator is now confused. They're trying to remember the first question. They're trying to remember the second question. And you've overwhelmed them and disrupted the flow. And also, you want them to be clear-headed and not overwhelmed, and also narrators can be concerned that they're gonna look stupid if they can't remember all the things you just asked them. So it's important to only ask one question at a time. So you've come prepared with a great set of questions that you'll ask one at a time, and you're meeting in a comfortable environment for the narrator, preferably their home, and preferably they're in their favorite chair. Don't sit at a kitchen or dining room table, sit somewhere comfortable. Also sit somewhere quiet. Is there an air conditioner humming, a clock ticking, a barking pet? And ideally it's just you and the narrator. I recommend the person's spouse or sibling or children not be present. Invariably, the spouse takes over the trajectory of the conversation or the child interrupts and wants to correct mom um, you want the narrator to be able to focus on speaking to you, not having to manage a relationship. So you've set up your recording device, you've switched it on and introduced the interview by saying each of your names, the date, and the location where you're talking together, and you ask your first question. Then what? Then you shut up and listen, and listen, and listen. Give good eye contact active facial expressions to show that you're listening. Do not say, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> All of those verbal cues that we give in social conversations to let people know that we're listening end up really distracting on recording of an interview. You continue to keep your mouth shut long after you want to. It doesn't matter that you have another question about something that they just said. It doesn't matter that you know an interesting tidbit about something they brought up. You write down your follow-up question and you keep listening. You remind yourself the interview is not about you and you set aside that interesting tidbit you wanted to share. In response to a question, a good question, a narrator may talk five minutes or 20 minutes. When the narrator stops talking, you count to seven in your head before saying anything. Now that's a long pause that feels socially awkward but their minds are going, and this extra space allows them to make a connection and to pick up the thread again if they want to. Tell your narrator ahead of time about the extra pause so they don't think it's weird. <laughs> when it's clear they're done talking, you can ask the follow-up question that you earlier had been sparked for you and you had written down, or you can go on to your next planned question. An interview is not a social conversation. It's not really designed to be much of a back and forth. It's designed for you as the interviewer to really hear someone else. And so that requires the discipline to be quiet. Let the narrator take the response where they will. They don't need to stick religiously to the question. You want them to ramble because that's where you learn more interesting things. There would be some scenarios where you might redirect them, but generally you let them talk. Assuming you have the narrator's consent to contribute the interview to a collect collecting institution, and you'll need to get that consent in writing, along with a statement saying that the narrator did the interview voluntarily, 
You'll want to keep in mind that many people in the future will be listening to or reading the interview. Those people are interested in the narrator. It's not about you, so don't try to be a news anchor or an interesting character. Your job is to ask good questions and listen. Test your recording equipment ahead of time, of course, and check it occasionally throughout the interview to be sure you're capturing the audio or video. Most of all, have fun. As you conclude, generally, genuinely thank your narrator for sharing. As I said earlier, it's a vulnerable place to be if you're the one telling the stories, opening up about what you've experienced, and how you think. Listening well honors the narrator and a warm thank you matters. Let them know when they can expect to see a transcript. So whether or not you are conducting an oral history interview, um, you'll want to search for relevant oral histories that may already exist and might help you on your genealogical journey. I reached out to a colleague, Dr. Marilyn Parrish, who is Special Collections Librarian and University Archivist at Millersville University, and she provided these tips for finding oral histories. You can begin by doing a simple online search, for example, World War II Oral Histories Pennsylvania, or Oral Histories Pittsburgh, or Oral Histories York County. Typically a search that includes the geographic area and the time period, along with the words oral histories, will pull up what's available at historical societies, universities, libraries, um, and other organizations that may have at least some of their oral histories available in digital form. Often some form of transcript or outline accompanies the oral history, and it's available. Most repositories will have additional oral histories on site, but while we're living in COVID times, accessing oral histories virtually is the safest way to research, of course. Here are some of the institutions and projects that are well known for doing outstanding work with oral histories. The University of Kentucky, Baylor University and Columbia University, the Veterans Oral History Project, StoryCorps and the Library of Congress are other very good resources. Be sure to peruse online exhibits focused on geographical areas, topical areas, or family names that connect with your genealogical interests. Some of these exhibits feature oral histories as part of the online exhibit. Dr. Parrish notes that at Millersville, only a few of the many oral histories they hold are available online at this point. Several of their online exhibits feature oral histories. One features students of color, one a faculty strike of 2016, and one is about Millersville's 150th anniversary. These are their online exhibits. Keep in mind that universities offer other digital collections that genealogists often find helpful too, such as in the case of Millersville, they have college catalogs back to 1855, yearbooks, student handbooks, alumni publications, and the like. She says they're great resources for tracking down information relating to family members who attended. Finally, let me feature for you the incredible resource that Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society offers to help your genealogical research journey. Visiting our website is a great place to start or stop by. We're currently open Tuesday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Have you heard of our genealogical card file? For more than 50 years, we've been carefully documenting genealogical information, and it started out using index cards and is now done electronically. You may have encountered an image of one of these cards through Ancestry.com, which scanned the index card collection and made them searchable through their website. This collection of information covers an estimated 800,000 individuals. So as Jonathan mentioned earlier, um, you don't have to have a known, necessarily a known Mennonite connection in your family. There are lots and lots of uh, folks in this database um, and it may be useful to you. We have an outstanding collection of published genealogies 
We have genealogical databases to share and a significant collection of family Bibles, which as you know, often have genealogical information in the front or at other places throughout. Some of our online resources are available to the public and some require membership to access. You may be familiar with um, our publication, Pennsylvania Mennonite Heritage. How many of you have seen this? Good, about half. Uh, this is a quarterly publication accessible to members and it often features um, reader's ancestry. So you may find it interesting. For those of you um, who are here in the room, you can pick up a handout over on the side table that gives more information about what you can expect to find at Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society for genealogical research. We'd love for you to become a member and take advantage of all that we have to offer to um, help in your genealogy journey. Thank you. What questions do you have? I have actually two comments. Um, the first one is about the card file. Hmm. People need to understand that the card file contains references to all different types of things and not necessarily original sources. And a couple of times I've been trying to track down <laughs> something that's on the card and it was just uh, somebody had sent a letter or something to the Smoke Society and they prepared a card saying, well, this is what the genealogy information is in this letter. But there's no other source to go to. And um, unfortunately, in this case, one case I was working on, there were conflicting death dates and they both came from the card file. <laughs> but I don't think I was able to determine which was the correct death date. Um, that's for the card file. As far as oral history, if you're going to donate it anywhere, it's so important to have a release form because the person's words are copyrighted by the, the, the narrator, the speaker. And therefore, if you do not have a release form, there, that oral history falls under the copyright laws, which are, it's decades before that, decades, maybe even a century before that can be released. And um, that's a problem archives are having all the time is they have these oral histories that no release forms were issued and were all paying for. And, and um, now that the, the narrator's deceased and the family may not even know that, that the oral history exists, but uh, the ar archives can't release it because there are no written release forms. So it's very important to have that form, like you said, to say that they did it voluntarily. And the best thing to have is to say is that they release all rights uh, to any as aspect of the publication or whatever so that the, the uh, receiving institution can make it readily available to people. Yeah, Jonathan is um, pointing out the important topic of copyright and ensuring that if you are going to contribute an oral history to um, an institution that can hold it and share it, that the proper releases have been uh, signed because otherwise it reverts to a very restrictive um, holding until it can be open to the public. So yes. Good. And if you, if you go to the website of the Oral History Association, they have a, a at least they did the last time I checked out a page that has all the different forms. You get a, a sample release form to use. So you don't have to create yourself to go there and they have all the tools that you really need. To, to yeah, the Oral History Association is a wonderful resource and um, he's pointing out that their website provides some sample uh, templates that you can use for this kind of purpose. Other comments or questions? Mike. Um, this gentleman was blessed to uh, talk to the great aunt. I was blessed to talk with my grandmother. Uh, she actually helped me start a genealogy in ninth grade. And uh, I, our interviews started in that comfortable chair and back to her home. Uh, but then we expanded, and I just thought I'd bring this up into taking rides and who her uh, houses that she lived in over the 
example and suggestion. Um, he's saying that he benefited from, after some of the initial conversations with his grandmother in, in her home, in her comfortable chair, um, driving together to places that were important and hearing stories in that context that could really spark information that was helpful. Yes. Another comment, which is sort of also from Mike's initial comment about the Asian Duck Christmas. This was this last year, and in a conversation with my mother about Thanksgiving, she's from a farming family in York County, and I always just assumed they had a turkey dinner every year, but before the mid 1950s, when she was a child, butchered every um, Thanksgiving. That's, that was Thanksgiving. And then I asked other people at the church that I go to, yeah, they didn't do a turkey dinner either. That was always butchering day. Mm -hmm. And I think it was pretty widespread in the country. And a lot of times you don't realize these things. You just assume because my experience has always been a turkey dinner on Thanksgiving, but that was not the general experience in the community. Yeah. So um, Thanksgiving day being butchering day rather than turkey dinner day, it's it strikes at the kind of thing that I think often happens when we just have a few shreds of information in general. We just go back to what we know and assume that that ties things together. And so sometimes oral histories can really kind of change, um, stop that assumption process and bring something that's helpful. Yes. Um, I just uh, caused me to recall something that happened. When I was in junior high school, in the ninth grade, we were asked one time to see if we could put together a family tree, you know, uh, from whatever resources we had. And I remember I was sitting down with my two grandmothers and my one grandfather who was still living. And they were, uh, they told me all the names of their ancestors that they could remember, back to their grandparents. And I carefully wrote these down, and I never forgot those. I can still sit down and quickly write out the names that they, were, they gave to me. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it was many years before I got interested in family history. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, really was uh, the uh, the foundation stone on which I began to build family histories. What a gift! Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, and if there's nothing else right now, the meeting is adjourned. You can socialize a little bit before we have our board meeting. Socially distanced, of course. <laughs> <laughs>